All right, we're good? Yep. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our open mic with the Pat Conroy Literary Center, also in partnership with the South Carolina Writers Association. Uh, we have great writers uh, here with us this evening, and our featured writer and poet and reader for the evening is Lynn Lawson, who will be concluding our open mic. Um, we're going to get started um, with our first three readers. Susan, you're up. Okay, I'm up. Um, yep. This is another scene from my uh, short story, Virgin's Rule. It takes place at a Montana university in 1964. It's a look back. The women's movement barely breathes. Roe is 10 years away. I've scooched back a couple of paragraphs just to get the right. Some of you heard the first part before. Uh, Sadie Hawkins is a character from the comic strip, Little Abner. Her unsuccessful pursuit of the male animal is celebrated annually with a costume dance at the university. Sadie Hawkins Day is the only time girls can ask boys for a date. Sarah jams into the third floor phone booth. Hi, Freddie. Will you go to the Sadie Hawkins dance with me? Yes. Why are you whispering? Line drop. Sarah dances on her bed. High slit skirt barely covers her butt. Lime green stockings. See-through lime green top, black half bra. Justine Gates, that's your costume for the dance? A prostitute? Not just any prostitute, Justine. The Parisian streetwalker, Irma LaDuce. Best movie this year. Shirley MacLaine plays Irma. Sarah hands Justine a movie clipping. Irma's boyfriend is Nestor. Jack Lemon plays Nestor. Justine stares at the clipping. You'd look just like her. Does Freddie know? Sarah hops off the bed, slips on high heels, prances to the door. Are you kidding? Freddie waits in the parlor costume as a football hero. Sarah sachets down the stairs. Irma LaDuce, Parisian streetwalker, Freddie sits very still. He can't breathe. Sarah's costume wins first plot prize at the Sadie Hawkins dance. Her trophy bounces in the back seat. Freddie drives a rough road bending around campus, parks by the river, takes Sarah in his arms, lowers her to the seat. Her arms flail. Freddie, get off. You're suffocating me. Freddie rolls fast. Sarah straightens. If we're going to do it, Freddie, let's do it right. She carefully rolls down green stockings, neatly folds them on the dash, shakes off her skirt, smiles winningly. Line drop. Hours after the dance, cars pull up to the dorm. Justine watches from her third floor window. Couples scurry to make curfew. She smiles, it's time. Leaves the window, heads toward the stairs. Freddie kisses Sarah goodnight on the porch. She floats up the stairs. Justine is coming down. Sarah, cover for me. Justine hisses, ducks through the crowded parlor, out the front door. Cowboy Dash likes his bar this time of night, dark, empty. Sweet smell of spilled beer. Jukebox glow, the only light. Dulcet tones of dusty Springfield. The door bangs, he turns. Sorry, Justine sits on a stool. Long legs dangle, hello cowboy. He grins wide, you're here. Justine sways toward him, as promised. His long fingers slip under her skirt. Lift her silky butt onto the smooth slam of the jukebox. Sadie Hawkins night. Sadie Hawkins day. University. 
<laughs> Remember that year as well. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. She not hear me? Or does she hear me? Can anyone hear me? Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh, that feeling of like saying something and you don't know if anyone heard you. You're like, hey, I'm here. Um, okay. Well, Arthur, we have you next if you're ready. I am. I am. Um... Oh, there's Elizabeth. I have a poem that I know Len heard a while ago, but um, it's a, a newer one. And um, it's about how I became me. I finally figured it out after all these years. Um, it's, and by way of explanation, maybe alibi or mea culpa, uh, but I'm a Penn State graduate. And they have, it's very, there's a mall that leads up from College Avenue to the library. It has different names. I'm calling it the Allen Street Mall. And one of my professors had talked about uh, uh, the inspiration you get maybe for the millionth step on that mall when you suddenly, it hits you. And maybe it hit me at some point. This is called Transformation Along the Allen Street Mall. While shedding my youth, I walk the mall up and down, through the iron grill, past the obelisks, under tall elms, savoring shag cut cavendish, crisscrossing between buildings, hairy and bearded, often in a hurry. At times, hand in hand to concert or show, more often with others, minds inflamed with visions as we yearn to snatch fire from the stars hanging beyond the tall elms. Castalia called me colorful flowers alongside lush green spaces, inspiration from books and people flowing around me day and night. As best I could, I captured in verses all the beauty that hovered around me. Underwood typewriter as instrument to render my thoughts, then on air sign, finding my voice. Slowly the veil was lifted. Slowly I sensed what and where life would lead. In time, I followed the sun thousands of miles from the mall, through another iron grill, past other flowers. Lines of faint praise preceded me to the far coast. Baffled, I heard a newer song and followed its pleasing melody. Every step on the mall fashioned me for every step I took towards places unknown, yet destined, brimming with wonder and joy, fixed in my mind, fashioned into verse as best as I could. Oh, very interesting. Thanks. Uh, my inspiration is um, Dylan Thomas's Fern Hill in terms of structure and somewhat the content. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, that's Thank beautiful. You, everyone. No, no mention of the Berkey Creamery at Penn State, Arthur? Well, that wasn't on the Allen Street Mall. Oh, okay. <laughs> I went to Summer School. Yeah, good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you had to take a right. From Patty Library and um, I forget the name of that road. Yeah, but that was, yep. The Creamery was great. That was great, Arthur. Um, okay, um, I am going to read a picture book. And this manuscript I wrote probably six or seven years ago. And um, dedicating, um, dedicating to my. To my uh, well, I hear a little bit of feedback, but it's fine. Um, dedicating this to my godmother, my great aunt. It's titled Forget for God, A Sweet Carolina Adventure. There was a lost lady who lived in wild woods all by herself alone. She grew her own food and stocked her own shelves from her garden rung in stone. She rose with the sun and slept with the stars as happy as she could be. Hey. No, no friends came to call. No people at all were part of her family tree. Miss Sweet was her name, her first and her last. That's all she could remember. For 30 fast days, she lived out lost years, the ninth month of September. 
One precious morning, she knelt in soft soil, counted to three once more. Her ears heard a word so strange and absurd. Her voice, it sang, number four. Four is the number that comes after three, Miss Sweet remembered, oh my. She counted four sheep by starlight that night, a four sheet song lullaby. Morning light came, she flew out of bed, a new day of hope awaited. Wearing PJ's wild striped socks, she knelt in her garden, elated. One and a two and a three, oh no. She counted red blooms with a sigh. Her mouth lay open, so quiet of sound, Miss Sweet, she started to cry. What is the number that comes after three? She asked the flowers so red. She tried again with hands on her hips, numbers they swirled in her head and a one and a two and a three and a her tongue tied into a knot she ripped up fourth flower tossed it away she hoped to forget forgot warmth of the sun caught her by surprise she wondered why tears wet her face she found a red flower in the far yard tilled up a soft soil space she set the root ball snug deep in a hole and straightened the stem upright she stroked the red petals, nose to the core, and sniffed sweet scent with delight. A bug buzzed her nose, and she did suppose was lost in her garden bouquet. What bug are you, Miss Sweet sneezed, achoo. She swatted the winged bug away. Good morning, Miss Sweet, said her mystery. It wore pollen pants, six long. Leave me be, said Miss Sweet. How do you know me? Now go, winged bug, be gone. Don't make me sing. Just look what I bring to fill your full garden with blooms. I work together with sun and rain, sleep under the light of the moon. Miss Sweet was shocked. It called her by name, for she knew the bug not a bit. Her thoughts, they swirled inside of her head. Who are you? She asked. I forget. Oh, pardon me, my name is Busby. We share the same sun every day. Come fly with me, let's buzz to my tree. You and I, we both know the way. Miss Sweet, unsure of Busby's chit chat, walked a path worn down to the ground. And there she found in the trunk of a tree, a beehive buzzing with sound. Stop here, said Busby, don't come too near. The guard bees at hive gate will sting. They will send an alarm, all bees will swarm. Wait here to see what we bring. Here is your cup. We filled it up. Our sweet honey is earthbound delight. Now turn and be gone. Fly the path home. Have a lovely and restful night. Miss Sweet looked confused and looked at her shoes, unsure of what to do next. She smiled at Busby and the hive in the tree, tilted her head perplexed. Busby waved fast wings, a curious thing, waggled round her nose once more. Miss Sweet found her home past garden and stone by footsteps one, two, three, four. Honey and tea and honey on toast, Miss Sweet garden this way and that. She slept each night by new day's delight for red blooms and Busby's chit chat. There is a Miss Sweet who lives in wild woods all by herself alone. She lives out her days in fantastic ways, her yesterdays gone unknown. Her best friend, Busby, lives in her tree, untangles her tongue in a knot. Busby does be best, like all of the rest, and helps her forget, forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Very well, though. <laughs> I'm counting on you to bring back rhyme into contemporary poetry all by yourself, Lisa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do it, Barry. Okay, <laughs> I'm counting on you. Don't feel the pressure. What great, great, a great rhythm, too. It just really flows. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I know I didn't announce who was coming up next, but um, Brad, <laughs> surprise. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I have, I have a, I guess a creative nonfiction piece here. Uh, okay. Brooke, we like to limit to what, three or four minutes? Is that right? Three minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th I, I think this might run over. I haven't read it for uh, time, but so give me a signal at three and I'll do some real time editing here to the finish if I'm over, okay? So, so uh, in, in various parts of the country, 
uh, trout are starting to get hungry for and fly fishing and are thinking about getting out, probably not in the northern climes, but uh, soon will be. So this is a fishing story it's called The Perfect Loop. The fly sailed through the air with the gentle grace of a wind-born dandelion seed and the effortless intent of a soaring bird. It made several sweeping loops and settled delicately on the water's surface. Glenn was hoping the sidewinder, no hackle, done fly would fool some trout into thinking it was a tasty mayfly. He had tied it himself last winter. Glenn had tied at least a dozen, dozen flies last winter while holed up beside the fire in his backwoods Pennsylvania cabin. Probably a glass of good bourbon close by while he stared through the magnifying lens, winding thread around fur bits and who knows what with his fine tweezers. I could see him there giving the occasional longing glance out the cabin window at the ice-crusted trout stream that ran right through his property a few yards from the very table on which he had scattered a chaotic collage of various tufts of barmet fur feathers, assorted colors and strengths of wire and thread, several strange looking instruments and hooks so small you'd think he was going fishing in some, someone's goldfish bowl. A brilliant engineering based research scientist when he is not at work wrestling down algorithms or measuring some physics tolerance to the 16th decimal, he's thinking about fly fishing or standing in a stream casting rhythmically to the beat of whatever insect is hatching at the time. The dichotomy of Glenn's passion for science and fly fishing has always intrigued me. The precision mathematical structure and linear process of science versus the unpredictable, uncontrollable ecology of nature. Scientific process immersion versus the Zen-like connection of one with nature. Not that fly fishing doesn't involve science. The best fly fishermen could teach a, a college level entomology course. Insects make up the major portion of a trout's diet. You have to know insects to know how to catch trout. Fly fishermen can spout about bugs more than a doting parents fuss over their newborn babies. I've watched Glenn standing in the middle of a trout stream, scoop up a handful of water, bring it close to his nose and study it like he was reading the fine print on a medicine bottle. Then he'd change the fly he was using and catch a trout on the third cast. I learned he had scooped up a nymph or a dun, a stage of the insect's life cycle where it's waterbound, candy to a trout, and duplicated the look of the insect with the new fly. The most alluring and elegant part of fly fishing is casting the perfect loop. The most effective way to catch a trout is casting the perfect loop. The most elusive part of my humble fly fishing skill was always casting the perfect loop. It's a radiant thing to a fly fisherman, rewarding and gratifying while challenging. Maybe so satisfying because it's so challenging. The perfect loop can be an end in itself, as delicious as actually catching the fish. Like a gentle ocean wave that flows calmly on the beach to end its journey, the perfect loop is art in motion. <clears throat> Casting the perfect loop also requires some science. 10 and two, 10 and two, back and forth, back and forth, with the fly rod held high and the line extending rhythmic, rhythmically, with the metrodome-like metronome action of the rod. 10 and two, the basic physics of fly casting that will yield the perfect loop if executed within the laws of the mechanics. Fly casting is not like swinging a baseball bat. Pull it back, swing hard for the fence and let it fly. A fly tied to the end of the fishing line has no weight, so the fishing line is slightly weighted to facilitate casting. While, re while repeatedly and ry rhythmically altering the fishing rod from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and gradually letting out more line, the fisherman is able to gently and naturally drop the fly in the desired spot in the stream in a way that mimics a live insect, if she can get that perfect loop at the end of the last cast or something within a fairly narrow window of perfection. The penalties for casting outside the window of perfection are many, but the one that can make me cringe at the thought is pure raw embarrassment. 
take the rod back too far, cast too hard with too much line out, and you'll be wearing the fly on some part of your clothes, your hat, or worst of all, digging it painfully out of your skin and trying to pretend nothing happened. Lose a smooth rhythm and sync with the line, and you'll be staring up at a tree instead of the stream, trying to extract your fly out of branches that seem to have swallowed it. Misjudge the timing and you'll be fumbling hopelessly with a tangled maze of fishing line that has no start and no end. Trout are very smart. Their survival depends on it and they've survived millions of years. They know when something's not natural and something when some hapless fly fisherman is a hopeless caster. No loop, no trout, another humili humiliating punishment. I'm gonna to skip to the end here now. Uh, one unforgettable outing, Glenn's intriguing science and Zen dichotomy became as clear to me as the pristine trout stream in which we were standing. Glenn wields fly fishing, cast, fly casting magic. He can cast the perfect loop with his eyes closed. I think he did it quite often. For a long time, I couldn't do it if I had eyes in the back of my head. Glenn knew that I had understood basic 10 and two physics and even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. Sometimes I even caught a fish, probably the dumbest trout in the stream. Glenn stopped fishing and waded down to where I was frantically struggling with another self-inflicted tangle ball of line confusion while trying to look like I was having no problem and really just a cast away from the big one. The mayflies were hatching like chicks in an incubator and the trout were rising left and right in a feeding frenzy, perfect fishing conditions. And I was embarrassed again that he had to take quality fishing time to mitigate my ineptitude. He straightened my line with one gentle pull like untying a shoestring, validating my inadequacy and making me want to sink into the stream and hide under a rock. He looked at me with a wry smile that good buddies do to bust each other's chops for almost any blatantly stupid behavior. I felt the patient empathy behind it. He said, stop a minute. Close your eyes and take a deep breath. Concentrate on the sounds of the stream, the woods, the wind in the trees. Breathe deeply and exhale the tangles, tree hookups and bad timing. Get it out of your system. We stood there for a few moments. I opened my eyes and he said, feel it, don't do it. Feel the timing and balance like the natural flow of the stream and the wind. Feel the power and rhythm like the trout swimming upstream. It's music. It's the stroke of the artist's brush. Don't do it. Don't think about it so much. Feel it. I can still snare more fishing line in a day than Glenn will do for a season. The trees still snatch more of my, my flies than I'll ever admit, but there's no 10 and two in my casting protocol, no physics thinking in my constant effort to improve my casting and no embarrassment when I'm standing in the middle of a trout stream with my eyes closed and my deep breathing purposeful. There are more trout liking my flies now. You have captured that sport perfectly. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Beautiful, Brad. Thanks. Brad, can you Brad that was so nice. We haven't heard you read in so long. Thank you, Brooke. Brad. Thank you. Brad. Oh, look, Mary's. You see it? Oh yeah. Oh, Are you a fly that. fisherman, Barry? Oh, wow. my, my stepfather was a, a maniacal fly fisherman. <laughs> yeah. He made all these flies. He tied them all himself. Yeah. Wow. Beautiful. It's, it's quite an amazing. My father part. was it. My father was a fly fisherman. He tied all his own flies. And so did Brad Pitt, actually. Oh, really? Hmm. You'll recall. <laughs> really? <laughs> hmm. You mean in that movie? Nobody got that. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. A river runs through it. There you uh, go. I watched yeah. it because Brad Pitt was in it. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah I've been thinking, I was thinking of Brad Pitt through your whole thing. It was really <laughs> quite enjoyable. Well, I'm mistaken with Brad Pitt. All <laughs> well, well, he looks like him. You know. <laughs> yeah. Right. He looks much alike. Ed yeah. Ringer. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you saw in the chat where I put. Yeah. You want me to be next? Internet. And then Barry's next. Yeah. Perfect. I don't I'm, like interrupting people to say who's next. So I may just yeah, put it in no, the I'm, chat. I'm sure it's tonight. I, I'm uh, reading a piece that is uh, inspired by a pretty famous painting.
that you probably have all seen. Um, it's a Bruegel called The Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And what's uh, notable about it um, is that basically it, it's a huge painting of a, a landscape with a, a person in the foreground who's like plowing his field. And, and, you know, it's called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. Well, the Fall of Icarus is this like teeny little like bit of the painting where you can barely see the splash when he goes in the water. Um, so a lot of people have written pieces on this particular painting. Sisyphus and Icarus. Pushing immense boulders up rock strewn hills, the labor satisfies day after day, we toil like bark beetles in a killing repetition. Sporadic praise, a plaque or two, buttress an ocean. Work fashions immortality. We furrow the world with that rock's rut, avoid stubbing toes, tripping sometimes. Often we're overrun. Each kudo rolls back over us on the way down what to do? Should we, like Icarus, invent an airborne flight to freedom, rocket to Neptune's moons, flit about begonias and bluebirds, shoot through the Milky Way? Escape, it seems, offers its own perils. Soar too close and wings melt. We tumble back into oatmeal and broken fingernails. That fatal flaw fall into the ocean does not lift the placid plowman's head. The straits maintain the solidity and geography and Bruegel's hero lands as one tiny splash. The lesson clear as fresh ice skimming the bay, choose honest labor or skating loose as opposing bookends, the story in between remains. We live and die between the bark and the wood. Mm. I love your poetry. <laughs> Thank you, that's very nice of you. All right, next we have, I don't know, um, Yvette, were you reading tonight? Did you see? Mary. She there? Oh, there she is. Oh, what about Barry? Yeah, Barry's next. Barry's next. Oh, sorry, I was looking at the. I'm so sorry, Barry. <laughs> okay. Barry's next. Barry. Barry. I had, I had already. Yeah, I was glad on. you did it that way because now I didn't have to follow him. <laughs> <laughs> now he's gonna follow you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, so it's is it is it I? It is you, Barry. I'm so sorry. I just looked down. The chat and forgot that I had put the new three up there. Um, I wanted to do something for about Valentine's Day. I looked through all my stuff, looked through my uh, poetry book, which I always <laughs> maybe today available on Amazon. A lot of people think the title of this is maybe today. It's not. It's maybe today available on Amazon. Uh, Okay, um, and, and the, the collection of micro memoirs, and I never realized how many things I have on relationships. It's unbelievable. Um, but I settled on something to, to continue reading the uh, micro memoirs that are slightly longer than three minutes that I didn't used to read, but I've been sort of going through them. And I found one here that I like, so I'm going to share it with you. These are I see some unfamiliar faces out there. These are uh, from a collection of micro memoirs titled Barry Who? 33 Unforgettable Micro Memoirs from Someone You Never Heard Of. And it's just incidents from life and they all come with a date. And this one is 1980s. And it's called Come Here Often? Back in my unattached days, I must have met women a hundred ways. Bars, classes, blind dates, golf courses, ads, pools, weddings, walking down the street. 
One time I had a few drinks at a party, tripped over a coffee table and fell on top of a lady on the couch, spilling my gin and tonic on her head. She must have liked it because we dated four months, though I don't necessarily recommend the technique. One of my favorite meetings was Missy, the woman I ran into in the supermarket. After the landing on top of one story, let me assure you, ran into is just a metaphor. I was placing a box of Cap'n Crunch in my cart when I spotted this attractive petite lady at the end of the aisle. She was looking up at the shelf where Count Chocula resided. She reached, but without success. She tried jumping and reaching simultaneously. Intriguing though that was, I had to end this struggle. I wheeled over, pulled down a Count Chocula and handed her the box. She expressed appreciation and we moved on. A few minutes later, I was walking up another aisle. Guess who was coming the other way? Thank you for getting the cereal, she said. Thank you for making me feel tall, I replied. <laughs> that was all it took. The conversation began which led to dinner, which led to dating. Funny, I remember vividly how we met, but have no recollection of how we fizzled. For all I know, she may have dumped me for someone she met in the meat section. <laughs> in any case, Captain Crunch and Count Chocula turned out to be incompatible. Which brings me to my all time favorite meeting. I was waiting at a red light, tapping on the steering wheel to Michael Jackson's Beat It. A BMW 320i pulled up next to me. My first thought, what, they don't have car washes where you live? <laughs> I checked out the driver. There sat a striking brunette about my age. I watched as she pulled out a lipstick, turned the rear view mirror toward her and began applying. Now, there are times when I am quite shy but there are times when I swear I'll say anything. I lowered my window. Why bother, I said. She quickly turned toward me. What, she snapped. Why bother? What's the difference? She flashed a dirty look like I never saw, but she didn't know where I was headed. You can't improve upon perfection, I continued. It's like the Mona Lisa. She shouldn't smile a little more, shouldn't smile a little less. Leave it alone, it's perfect. She glared a few seconds, then broke into a big smile of her own. So did I. Well, aren't you cute, she said a bit facetiously. We stared at each other. Then I got out of my car, walked to her right front fender, and scrawled my phone number into her, well, dirt. I returned to my car, gave her a final smile as the light changed and drove away. Lo and behold, that evening while I was watching Cheers, the phone rang. You're quite the smooth talker, aren't you? Said the female voice. Mona, I said. Unfortunately, this turned out to be more proof that interesting meetings do not necessarily lead to lasting <laughs> relationships. We had some fun dates, including the night we both fell asleep during the Broadway show, Starlight Express. But the weekend she was supposed to call and didn't, I have to assume it was on purpose. While I knew her, she never once washed her car. So, it's not like she lost my number. <laughs> Great. Cute. Oh, cute. You are hilarious. I've always loved that one, Barry, but I still can't figure out how you could fall asleep to Starlight Express. There are all those roller skates whizzing around you. Yeah, right. Oh, you saw it. Oh, it was just not very good. <laughs> no, but it was crazy. <laughs> It is noisy, yes, you're right. But but my, probably my least favorite of all time, and hers too. Oh, God, you're funny. <laughs>
Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you. Same to you. Happy Valentine's you. Day. Happy Valentine's oh. to you, Barry. Yes, you very, sound very like quite the romantic. Oh, gosh. Oh, <laughs> God. This is all free Kathy days. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to warn everyone that there's a toddler in here. So any errant noises belong to her. That, that's what Brooke's always saying about her dog, too. We, we don't know if I believe her. She's adorable, though. So we, 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 I think you should let her do the reading for you. As much as they, she, they talked about it. She likes to talk. <laughs> they talked about it last time. Yeah. That's what I remember. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This evening, we're going to look at the poem in which words don't deserve this. They have been around a long time, served us well. Why then do we use them like poison blue darts? Words have been so kind as to adapt. They wanna stay relevant too, but we spit them into red plastic cups like back of juice and leave them on the side of the road. They never harmed us, yet we turned them ugly side out, pit them against each other, use our fangs to inject venom. The poor words can't be unheard. The ring after of their scent makes folk mad. I hope they don't cry. I hope they don't die by suicide. I hope they don't vanish within. Then we will never again find the words. They might like that though, scrub clean, with different color hair. They can hold hands, stroll the streets, carry their shopping bags, or look for a bistro in peace. Thank you. Wow, what a different way of looking at things. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Yvette. Hope you come again. Yes. Please come again. <laughs> I love the ugly side out. Yeah. I hope they don't cry. <laughs> great, great images. Yeah, yes, really good. definitely. I will. <laughs> I just got so sick of everything in the news and all the name calling and you're this and you're that and ugh, I couldn't take it. Words matter. So, so well put though. Yes, so they do. Well put. Just they really do. Twist. Really good. All right, Jane, you're up. Next, all right. Well, um, I'm gonna read a short, short chapter from my novel to the last home run. <clears throat> it follows the one that I read last month about the main character's wife, Angela. Um, he and she are from two different cultures. Angela is an Italian American from the North End of Boston and Jimmy's an Irish American from Charlestown. Um, so this story gives a little bit more backstory, uh, specifically what makes Jimmy who he is, and going forward, why each of them will act predictably to the conflicts that they will face later on. Um, they're two very ordinary people in the middle of a watershed time in Boston's history. And it's a time in which everyone will have to confront their prejudices about race, ethnicity, class, religion, uh, and sexual orientation. And in the background are the Red Sox who are emblematic of fans like Jimmy and Ange. And they too struggle, stumble, win and fall again. But this is about Jimmy and Angela. Okay. The chapter is called The Old Block and it's set in Charlestown, which is a suburb of, uh, well, to, to uh, exurb of, of uh, Boston. Fall of 1967. 
Jimmy lumbered up three flights of stairs to the apartment he and his wife had recently found further down Soli Street from his parents' place. His breathing was ragged and he tried not to dwell on how out of shape he'd become since high school, concentrating instead on getting his new key into the deadbolt lock. When it refused to slide in, he closed one eye on the, uh, to halt the spinning of the hallway. That's the trick, he thought, as the key went home with a satisfying click. <clears throat> The door creaked open to a silent three rooms. Jimmy swayed from the kitchen through the small sitting room and into the bedroom. Their sleeping quarters provided little privacy. Its door had been removed long before their tenancy to make enough space for a double bed. Ange wasn't in it. He wound back through the kitchen to see if the small bathroom door by the stove was closed. Huh, not there either. She's always home from work by now. Lurching toward the refrigerator. Another beer always helps to clear my thinking. He spied a note taped to the freezer compartment above the chrome letters, Kelvinator. He located a bottle in the lower fridge first, managed to close the door, then ripped the note paper from the top half, dropping it and losing his balance as he bent to catch it. He landed on his side on the linoleum and giggled at himself, pulling the note close to his face and trying hard to focus on the writing. The pap's blue ribbon slid from his fingers and rolled towards the kitchen sink as his eyes crossed and gently closed. Mind drop. A dreadful thirst woke Jimmy the following morning, along with a persistent rapping on the apartment door. He rolled onto his stomach, planting his fists on the floor and willed his legs to follow suit. They did not. Wait a minute, hold your hosses, he yelled as he coaxed his knees up under his weight. Finally, his feet found purchase on the tile and he folded, unfolded upward, moaning as if a truck had run him over. A few sh shaky steps got him to the door. He opened it to find his da outside his large florid face awash with concern, his chest heaving for oxygen. Da? Cripe's sake, Jimmy. Bad enough I gotta come all the way up here. Let me get inside. Geez, smells like a brewery in here. His father eased himself into one of the folding chairs that sat at the kitchen table. He pulled out a large blue and white handkerchief, blew his nose and asked for a glass of water. While Jimmy found a clean cup and filled it with tap water, his father spotted the lined paper lying on the floor and raised his voice enough to make Jimmy wince. Did you not get your mother's note? You was to call her the minute you got in. She had to come all the way up here last night to leave that. God, what's going on? We got a call last night around 10.30. Got us out of bed. Lady runs Regina Pizza saying they were trying to reach you. When they couldn't, they figured out to call us. Must have called half of the Rooks in Charlestown before they got the right number. Angela's over at Mass General. Something wrong with her uh, female goings on. There's nothing wrong with Ange female wise now, believe me, Jimmy cracked. Wondering when his father was going to get to the point. His head hammered and he felt like he was going to heave. Damn, Jimmy, I knew your mother should have been the one to come to talk to you. She lost a baby. Ma lost a baby? What well, was my, no, you blooming idiot. Your wife lost a baby. It was some kind of scuffle outside of Regina's after closing. She took a bad fall on the street, almost got creamed by a cab. Jimmy's head began to pound in a serious way. A whirring sound rose in his ears. Angie's preggers? Was, Jimmy, have a little respect. Your brother Denny would never talk that way about his almost kid. In answer, the younger Rourke thudded into a chair next to his father, stared wordlessly at the older man, then gazed out the grimy kitchen window at the fire escape. As if on cue, the rain predicted by WBZ's late night weatherman began to pelt the potted plants and should forgotten to move inside. They're gonna drown or freeze or not end well, he thought. Then, why do I care about those stinking plants when I can't even think about us having a kid or not having a kid? 
what would me and Ange have done with a kid anyway? Jimmy held onto the edge of the table and stood on legs that felt as if they belonged to someone else. Guess I better clean up a little and get over there to see how she is. His dad drummed his fingers on the table and squinted up at him. Want my opinion, Jimmy? Probably not, but here it is anyway. You're a long time married. In you and Angela's case, you've done it all way too early. Jimmy grunted, Dow was not wrong. Now he couldn't even remember why they'd been in such a hurry to get hooked up, practically right out of high school. But he would never give the old man the satisfaction of admitting that. Well, thanks for coming, Dow. You shouldn't have come up over these stairs. I'd have found the note, you know. Tell Mar I'll come for dinner tonight, looks like. Unless they spring Ange, then I might bring Ange too. I guess she won't be going to work and she won't want to cook much. Da stood and shook his graying head. Yamar will be thrilled, I'm sure, he sighed. Thanks for the water, Jimmy. Tell Ange we're sorry. Dennis Sr. turned and descended the inside stairs and stood on the concrete stoop inhaling a long breath of damp fall air before making his way back up the street. Sometimes, he thought, I can't even imagine what these kids are thinking. The Bunker Hill Monument came into full view near the top of the incline. He paused and took in the stolid majesty of the white quarry granite structure, letting rivulets of rainwater run down his head and onto his shoulders. A sudden smile bloomed on his face and erupted into a belly laugh as he reached for the front doorknob. Who am I kidding? Sure, and he's a chip off the old block. He entered the dark hallway, recalling his wife's request that he please not yell in the house. Setting his mouth in a defiant smirk, Dennis Sr. bellowed toward the kitchen. Mary Margaret, thin the stew, the kids will be over tonight. He settled into his recliner pleased that she had a steaming cup of tea waiting for him on the side table, milk and sugar in just like he liked, with the morning edition of the Boston Herald next to it. He looked around the parlor, winked at President Kennedy's portrait on the wall, and exhaled a satisfied sigh. Life's good when you got them trained right. That's that. Very nice. Very, very nice. There's not a symbol here for cringe. <laughs> I'm cringing all the way through that. It's pretty bad. It's go pick bad. her up at the hospital and bring her over to Ma's for dinner. Um, we'll want to go to work. <laughs> clueless. No, it's, it's really great. It's very realistic, actually. Thank you. you know, the way things work. Well, the way they did then, anyway. That's right. Well done, Jane. Thanks. Very well done. Thanks. Time and place, you put us there. Don't say that too loud, Estelle. My dog will think she did something good. <laughs> well, is she is she is she up next? <laughs> well done, Jane. I don't think so. We're talking oh, about a different thing. Wrong day. thing to say. Wrong thing to say. <laughs> Just kidding. That was really great, Jane. We missed you. I missed you last month, Jane. I know, I know. I'm sorry. It just totally blew by the date. But that was, thank you for sending out the, the six months in advance now. That, yeah. that won't happen again. And thank you for naming your dog after me. That's very, very <laughs> It's a lovely name. I've always loved that name. Nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Estelle, I think you're up next. Okay. okay. Or Barry again, I could be wrong. Barry <laughs> again. Okay. For a small, uh, this is called Ukraine, the Ukrainian resistance. For a small Southern city girl who just spent four years in a Northern Indiana girls Catholic college, moving to Chicago was an eye-opening experience. Probably nothing conveys this idea more. This is memoir piece. Nothing. Probably nothing conveys this idea more than my roommate, Larissa Selowich, a dark-eyed, dark-haired beauty who is desperate to move out of her mother's home. This kid has got to get out of here, she said over the phone. 
she'd had a she had a low voice that I later realized sounded that way because she hardly moved her lips. But she was the closest thing I came to an urban hip woman in that town. There were hippies. This was the late 60s. My boyfriend was a hippie. He with his $75 a month welfare rights organizer job working with Jesse Jackson. I was paying group health claims at Travelers Insurance in a tall building in the loop, taking finishing college courses, uh, college finishing courses at night. Larissa was a social worker on the alcoholism unit at Cook County Hospital. Alkies, they're all the same, she said with a typical hard-nosed appraisal. Don't they get better? I asked, always the optimist, unfamiliar with active al alcoholism. They never get better. They relapse, she said, closing what could have been an interesting conversation. I quickly note, noted that if you were alcoholic, the people helping you might never believe in your recovery. Of course, since she was working for one of the largest public hospitals in the country, she was probably seeing the most destitute of the afflicted. I found Larissa through placing an ad in a local paper. I got this call from a woman who my age who let me know she was ready to get her stuff out and move as soon as her mother left for the weekend. Seems her mother was part of the Ukrainian resistance underground and they had lots of meetings. Her mother and the other house occupant, Larissa's uncle, would attend. So one Friday night, borrowing a friend's car, we went to a neat bungalow on the far south side, a stout brick house with rooms full of bowls of extravagantly decorated Easter eggs and Eastern Orthodox tradition. We extracted Larissa's rocking chair, clothes, music, stereo, and stole her away. Every other night from then on, or it seemed it was every other night, in our ancient fourth floor walk-up apartment with this large window view of the loop in the distance, Larissa's mother called, crying, begging her daughter to come back. Larissa let me know in that same tone she discussed the Alkies that that would never happen. As far as I could make out, Larissa's mother wanted her to marry a Yuki. But my roommate found men of her background undesirable. Larissa wanted to travel, experience life, meet someone other than a Yuki. Everyone has a fresh on your own for the first time story. I was seeing a lot of the River Shannon, our neighborhood bar and was on the Rush Street Bar softball team, hanging out with friends and hanging out with friends I'd made through the Martin Luther King March activities that summer. I was also taking journalism courses at night. I had bl black and Puerto Rican friends, not for the first time, but for the first time as true friends. Larissa dated a guy named John who was attending IBM school, though he lived in Minneapolis. I was as shocked as she after three months that school was over and he had to go back to his wife. While, I while Larissa was in heavy tears, I added to my book of new things I now knew not. Knew, not all uncles are really uncles and not everyone was, like my dad, completely faithful to his wife. I've, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that the uncle was admitted finally that he was a lover of her mother, not her, her uncle. Larissa loved the jet set, traveled to Bermuda or wherever spontaneously. And I guess to have more money, she left Chicago for the State University of New York at Stony Brook to work on a master's of social work degree. That winter, we'd all lived through a historic blizzard, one that laid snow, one that George R. R. Martin also experienced. It laid snow so deep that they became the, that snow became the inspiration for his novel series. You may know it as the Game of Thrones. I decided to move south to Atlanta, not far from my original home of Chattanooga. Joan, our third roommate, remained in our place with new people moving into the bedrooms. I remember, okay, sorry. I got a job in Atlanta excuse me, I got a job handling the Atlanta, Georgia news for, uh, for UPI. I was at work one night when I got a call from a young man in Chicago who hung out with us in Chicago. I think he was in love with Larissa and visited our apartment regularly. He called Larissa's mother and that was why he was calling me. Larissa died. The, all of a sudden, the news wires and typewriters clacking in the background fell back in my consciousness. I was shocked. 
Her mother told me she'd been in a bus accident and had lots of inter internal injuries. She lingered for a while, but died in a hospital in Puerto Rico. If you're in your young 20s, you're never going to die, and neither are your friends. This news shook me so. I called my former roommate, Joan, and relayed the news. It bothered me that the secret secretive mother did not try to reach Larissa's friends to tell them. From what I'd learned from our, from our friend, all this happened months before while Larissa was on a school break. I learned how you can be friends with some people, but their families will not recognize you. And I learned how grief will follow for a long time if you don't have some kind of ritual, a funeral, memorial service, something with which to acknowledge their presence and their leaving. It was a crazy time. We were all trying to go to San Francisco with flowers in our hair or try this new experience or that. Rather, though, rather than see Larissa's life as a cautionary tale to be careful what you wish for, being a jet setter, for instance, I remember being determined to live life to the fullest as you never know when it, it will draw quickly to the end. And that's the end. Wonderful experiential story. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Estelle. We haven't heard you here in a while either. I know. I think it really did help to get the advanced schedule because I can put it on my calendar and remind myself. So yeah. thank you. And you do say this emails, but I don't know about anybody else, but we all get a lot of emails. So <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's hard to find them when I need them. So that that automatic calendar will really be nice. Thank you. All right. Well, we have Melissa next, and then we'll have Lynn reading for us here at the end. Oops. Go ahead, Melissa. Good evening, Melissa St. Clair, and I am reading a couple of works from Homework, a collection of poems sparked by one white woman's journey on the matter of race. And poetry became a processing mechanism during this course led by Lynn Maureen Fertile Price. And Lynn asked the question, what does being white mean to me? Being white means to me, bearing a color I did not see. Living a life of white privilege, my school years were spent deciding whether to go or not to go to college. As a young adult, I hung out with a group of mixed races. I did not realize as we grew up, our lives were influenced by systems of varying paces. As a military family, we mingled with a mixing bowl. Little did I know the continued damage of years of injustice was taking a toll. Witnessing the video of the murder by an officer in blue of George Floyd, once I was awakened, I could no longer avoid. Ignorance is bliss. I am leaning in, learning all I can about systemic racism and how I can impact social justice. And the second poem is Cumbi. Spending time at a modern day pier, the Cumbie River raid occurred here. This gives me a shiver. Where Harriet Tubman led a detachment of the Union Army on steamships with her group of scouts, the mission, carry troops to destroy plantations and enslaved people to freedom deliver. To freedom, the people did shout. The river and marsh are quiet today. The sun reflects my shadow as the river reeds sway. Cool air chills my face. Vehicles traverse the Cumby on the Harriet Tubman Memorial Bridge at a steady pace. Do the travelers even realize the importance as they pass through this historical place? Thank you. Where, where is the bridge, Melissa? 
just outside, leaving Buford on Highway 17, uh, over the Cumby River is the Harriet Tubman Memorial Bridge. Be going 17 north from Buford. Hmm. It's a beautiful stretch of um, marsh. You're, you're immediately struck with the beauty of it. You're over a river. It's, a, it's the first river you cover, you cross as you're heading north uh, towards Charleston. Actually, yeah, it's the only big wide expanse, I think. Thank you, Melissa. I'm really glad that you did that project. It's, it's wonderful to hear. Yay. Thank you, Melissa, for reading tonight. You should join us again and again and again every month. <laughs> um, I apologize for my dogs barking beforehand. And Lynn, I apologize <laughs> if there's any barking during this introduction, but I don't think there's going to be because I, as I was muted, you didn't hear all the horribly verbal things I said to them. So I think they're quiet now. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, our featured uh, writer and reader tonight is Lynn Lawson. Um, and I'm going to introduce him for tonight. Uh, we worked with him last year for the uh, literary festival. Um, his workshops were um, really good. So it's nice to see you again, Lynn. Um, Lynn Lawson is the author of Chime. Uh, by Get Fresh Books 2019 and the chat book Before the Night Wakes You Finishing Line Press 2017. He's also co-editor of Hand in Hand Poets Respond to Race by Muddy Ford Press 2017 and The Future of Black Afrofuturism and Black Comics Poetry by Blair Press 2021. Congratulations Lynn. His poetry has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net. He's received fellowships from Tin House, Palm Beach Poetry Festival, Callaloo, Vermont Studio Center, and Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, among others. His poetry appears in African American Review, Callaloo, Mississippi Review, Ninth Letter, First Daily, and has been translated internationally. Lynn earned his PhD in English literature and criticism at Indiana University of Pennsylvania and is currently assistant professor of English at Newberry College. Help me everyone welcome Lynn Lawson. Hey, virtual applause. Um, thank you, Brooke, for the introduction. Uh, very Good much to see you again. Yeah, and no dog barks, so uh, I don't know whether she feel good or feel bad. I don't know. I don't know if I'm in the dog's good graces. We'll see. Um, I'm grateful to be working with uh, Pat Farmer and the Maria Center again. Um, always good to see uh, you, Jonathan, and uh, I'm grateful for the relationship that we have uh, with the center. And uh, it was inspiring to hear everybody's work. So uh, keep writing. It was a wonderful treat. And shout out to all my South Carolina Writers Association family that are here. There's a handful of us. So uh, I'm going to get busy with what I am tasked to do. I'm going to read a fistful of poems from a new book that will be forthcoming, um, center, centering around African American um, mental health and uh, trauma. Uh, of all kinds, I guess, mostly brought on by the psychological effects of race, ra uh, racism and slavery, but just in general, <laughs> just mental health, all right? There is kind of an art to this book, but uh, I'll just uh, start reading the poems. This one is called House Call. For Brianna, George, and today, Daquan. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3.20. Terror snatches at my neck, slams me against the peephole. I see the uniform, the badge, 
most importantly, the gun slams me to the courtroom floor of my mind to indict me for a bear trap of transgressions. Did I pay my rent, my taxes, my child support? Did I whistle at a white woman today? What did I do? What must I do to be saved? I opened the door. Does Daquan Ramsey live here? No, sir, I say trembling. My God, Daquan, where are you? And who are you? They are coming for you. Thank you and have a good day. I close my door, clutch my own throat now. Yes, a good day to you. And may your bullets sleep forever buried in their chambers. And may no blood be on your hands today or in your thoughts, I pray. Oh. There will be beaches. I'm just gonna run through these without much like intro, if that's okay with everyone. I'll let the poem do the work unless something is necessary. There will be beaches for tourists. We live on a graveyard arrowhead where the gullah battle hates and hags and spirits of indigenous tribes hover to claim what is theirs. Yes, there will be time for beaches. And on one in Charleston, my people were buried and buried themselves and walked on the ocean until it became their bodies. Yes, those flags still droop here and polished statues under them salute. Bones gather around their feet for the reenactments their sons crave. They kick the bones on their way to their sacrifice of burnt offerings from praying hands rubbed over burning churches. Yes, come for the sunshine, peeling your flesh. Stay for the smiles and hospitality, but don't forget the echo and chant of bones under your feet. So I mentioned uh, they have, the poems have sort of an arc in this one. So this is a fictional uh, story or arc about uh, a young man whose uh, father uh, willed him, well not willed him, but uh, you know, he inherited a fortune from his father, but he's addicted to gambling. So this is called, this is uh, Pantone, by the way, Pantone poem. Chamberlain Taylor gambles away his estate, 1853. Never met a bet he didn't like. Drank on riverboats and slung his cash. Blew on his hands and rubbed them for luck. High stakes claimed the Taylor family fortune. Drank on riverboats and slung his cash. Bet on everything not branded black. High stakes claimed the Taylor family fortune. Lost a hundred acres by a twist of roulette. Bet on everything not branded black, but bet on black and lost the plantation. Lost a hundred acres by a twist of roulette. Could have saved the estate with a twist of fate, but bet on black and lost the plantation. On the roulette table lay his deed and his pride. Could have saved the estate with a twist of fate. Deed to his daddy's life's work spun away. On the roulette table lay his deed and his pride. Could never show his face on a riverboat again. Deed to his daddy's life's work spun away. Hanged himself when the money ran out. Could never show his face on a riverboat again became an overseer on his daddy's gambled land, hanged himself when all the money ran out, used a slave ship to carry out the deed, sorry, used a slave whip to carry out the deed, became an overseer on his daddy's gambled land, buried on daddy's lost land as a memorial, used a slave whip to carry out the deed. His last bet was blacks would never be free. Buried on daddy's lost land as a memorial. State claimed the land and turned it into Calhoun. His last bet was blacks would never be free. Never met a bet he didn't like. Huh. Interesting. 
Pantone's a heart. Um, <laughs> this, this is more personal poem. Uh, it's called Bamboo Stew. We challenged each other to be chefs as kids without white hats or white aprons, without tools or recipes. We played with nature, filled found pots and bowls from the woods with mud, berries, leaves, bark, whatever mother earth allotted. With discarded and snapped tree limbs, we stirred and whipped and beat nature's fragments into wholeness until one of us went into his house and lathered his pot with shaving cream. The dreamy white of it, the holy viscous foam, stimulated froth from our mouths. It was no longer a game, now competition. No matter what the rest of us found in our parents' double wide trailers, we can never compete with the whiteness that changed the game. All right, um, I'm gonna end on this. So um, you all may be familiar with a uh, photo from the antebellum period. Uh, it's referred to as Slave Gordon, but it's like uh, one of the most striking images from that period where you have uh, and a formerly enslaved man, a uh, black man with these tons and tons of scars on his back. Oh. Um, so he has an actual story and uh, a history rather. And I was just fascinated by that. And uh, it's said to be made into a film upcoming about that. He, uh, once he escaped his Louisiana plantation, he uh, got up with the Union Army so this is kind of a speculative poem about that. Very uh, Afrofuturistic. So I wanna say thank you to you all for listening and being a captive audience. So this is just simply entitled Gordon. After the photo by William D. McPherson and Mr. Oliver, 1863, CDV by Matthew Brady, there's an epigraph from Virginia Hamilton's The People Could Fly. They say the people could fly, say the people who could fly kept their power, although they shed their wings. Africans and their descendants sold into slavery had special abilities. Gordon could create a GPS with the scars on his back. One needed only to place a hand on his back and the path to freedom emerged. He was a North Star bright as the morning. They called him Whit Peter, but his mutant code name was the Compass. This is how he found the Union camp after escaping from his Louisiana plantation. But he went back and helped more of his brethren escape. Of course, he could no longer live among them on the plantation. So he camped in swamps among alligators and moccasins. The freedom seekers sought him in the trees or under the surface of the river but he found them running for their lives as he had. He soothed their panic with treasure map patterns on his back. He embraced them with black skin crop circles. He placed their hands on him and they beheld his glory. He was a gift from above living like John the Baptist. He knew his calling was greater than the master's will. He knew even when he was tied to the overseer's post feeling the leather burn grace into his flesh. He knew when his screams echoed through the Southern wilderness, back across the ocean, onto the African shores and to the tribes that birthed him. He saw them with every clapping slice through his back, cracks of prophetic lightning to his soul. They appeared vividly, chanting with heavy breaths. They blew smoke into the air and the fog smelled out his name. He knew he had to liberate his people from bondage. They were already a free nation. Setha Suggs had a tree growing out of her back. It could reach into space with unborn babies and ancestors hovering on every limb. 
warring with a ghost who ate it at its roots. But Gordon the Compass had a rocket on his back, an ambassador to the cosmos. He piloted brothers and sisters saying, teach me, touch me, I'll take you wherever you wanna go. Thanks everybody. That from Chimes. Is that from? No, um, those poems are for, those are uh, already published, but they're not in a, in a book yet. Oh. oh. Yeah, well, I think most of them are found online, but uh, that one about oh. Gordon the Compass is, it was published um, internationally. It was like a, through, it was translated by a lady uh, from uh, Colombia approached me about translating the poem. Um, this is a make or break it's been break. published elsewhere. That is just stunning. stunning. Lynn, if it's possible, I'd like to know the names of the poems again so I can look them up. You said they might be online. I'll do better. I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you. Oh, what do you think? Those you. are powerful. I know that photograph. It's very famous and it's it's chilling. Yeah. It's arresting. It is. Mm. There's the, there it is. Four poems by Lynn Lawson. Thank you for the link. Thank you, Lynn, for uh, reading tonight for us. <clears throat> Also, I wanted to let everyone know um, who participated and also who, whoever's listening to us live on Facebook that Lynn, Yvette, and Robin, all three, will be presenting writers at our upcoming sixth annual March 4th event. Um, that'll be March 4th through the 6th. And you can go to our Facebook page or and um, see, you know, for more information on how to sign up for those events. So, um yes lynn yvette and robin will all be there so all three of you wave so we <laughs> you mean i get to leave my dining room yeah oh, yes yes <laughs> wonderful it's gonna be a great a great weekend Public poetry yes i don't know and right <laughs> and fiction <laughs> uh, i have to say the poetry has been it's just exquisite tonight Just oh to i know play. right yes yeah. yeah it was all good thank you all all right well i hope you all will come back next month um to read or watch listen um jonathan did you want to say anything else about tonight or upcoming say good night to your dog brooke yeah uh, yes your dogs, plural, uh, they've both become very well behaved. This was incredible. I'm so grateful to all of you for being with us. We had some first timers tonight in open mic, Yay. and that's always a pleasure. And some folks we have not seen before. Uh, and the capital T, capital H, capital E, Lynn Lawson as our featured speaker uh, tonight, yeah. which is always a treasure. It's always a joy to work with Lynn. Uh, he was also part of our Camp Conroy this past summer and was just incredible with our students. Um, so I'm always glad to see Lynn either on screen or in person. And thank right. you all so much for watching out there in Facebook land right now. And on in, in, and, uh, the YouTube version will be up in a little bit too. So please do continue to discover and watch and enjoy these videos and these magnificent poets and writers who we bring together each month. And could I mention, Brooke, you and I will be together on the 17th. We're doing a memoir workshop through the Pat Conroy Center. It's called yep. Ch Chunk, Sneak, and Bribe a Little. It's about next the Thursday. Long, yeah, next Thursday. The long memoir, uh, working on long work such as a memoir, getting through it. Um, and anybody's welcome to sign up. And we 
got a good group so far, and I think you'll find some really interesting stories there. As long as we're tell your friends, in, tell so your friends. Uh, Melissa, you want to say a little bit about what we're doing in uh, March 9th through the 12th? Yes, it would be my pleasure. Uh, Estelle and I are on the roster for an author meet and greet as one of a trio of events to benefit the Pat Conroy Literary Center. Uh, Lux Low Country Travel has put together some wonderful experiences for readers uh, to meet uh, authors. So check that out uh, on the Pat Conroy Literary Center Facebook page, website, et cetera, et cetera. So see you there. It's a really exciting lineup that our friend Susie McMahon has put together for uh, for that travel package with the public events and the events for our visiting folks as well. And if you're watching this on Facebook, as I imagine most people who are encountering this video are, you are literally just clicks away from finding that information as well. I'm looking forward to Valerie Sayers. This is her first uh, back in South Carolina public event. She's a great writer. Yeah, she is. Lots of stories. Welcome her back south. She was originally from Beaufort, took classes with Pat Conroy, went on to be um, write lots of novels and be head of uh, creative writing at University of Notre Dame. So she's now moved back, or at least for part of the year. <laughs> so that will be that same night, Melissa, the, the 15th, the March 9th. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Lynn, again, for reading for us tonight. Thank you, everyone, for reading and everyone for listening. Um, we hope to see you next month, month, March. March. Goes by so fast. Have a good night. Thank you. Hi, so thank you so very much. Name. Hi, everyone. That was Brad that said my name. Hi. Thanks, Brooke. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right. I know that voice. All right. <laughs> Bye, Brad. Brad, it was good to see you two nights in a row. <laughs>